thank you very much sir. ladies and gentlemen we will be moving on to the next symposium which is symposium number 4 on uh, lower education project this symposium will be chaired by dr mahanam gunasekar dental surgeon uh, at the national hospital of and dr dhuvind aryanath surgeon at the salambo Thank you very much. I have the honor of introducing three eminent speakers on the subject that is low GI surgery, which we have been waiting since morning to listen to. And the first speaker is um, Professor Anuradha Chandra Mohan. He is a professor of radiology from Christian Medical College, Bellur, India. I'm sure the uh, CV is displayed, so therefore I won't take time to introduce uh, or read the uh, long CV. Over to you, Professor Amrata Chandramohan. Very good afternoon, everybody, and greetings from India. Many thanks to Dr. Bhavanta and Dr. Fernando for this opportunity. Today, I'll be talking about the usefulness of MRI in rectal cancer patients. The key questions that the surgeons are faced with when we have a patient diagnosed with rectal cancer include, is the TME plane safe? Are there high risk factors for local recurrence and poor outcome? Do I need to consent and prepare the patient for permanent stoma? Is my patient a candidate for wait and watch? Is there a need for genetic screening of the family? So what is the objective of this presentation to tell you why MRI should be performed in rectal cancer patients, how should we MRI and what can MRI tell us. Why MRI? MRI because it can potentially answer all the key questions the surgeon is confronted with in a patient with rectal cancer. How to MRI? The most important thing is to use at least a 1.5 Tesla magnet and the money in MRI affected cancer lies in T2 high resolution images acquired in axial, coronal and sagittal planes. There is use of bowel preparation, rectal contrast, gadolinium and spasmolytics are optional and we don't do it in our center. What are the MRI don'ts? There is no need to use endorectal coil. In fact, an use of endorectal coil can compress the tissue and can lead to overstaging and it's also uncomfortable for the patient. No fat suppressed T2 weighted MRI because fat is actually a friend of the radiologist interpreting uh, MRI and suppressing it will actually be detrimental. The right plane of imaging a patient with rectal cancer is a plane that's perpendicular to the rectal tumor. And this is vital to make an accurate estimation of circumferential resection margin and the T stage. What all can MRI tell us? It can tell us all these things listed in this slide and we look at them one by one. The location of the rectal tumor is determined with respect to the distance from the anal verge. Depending on the distance, it's classified as low, mid and high rectal cancer ranging from up to 5 centimeters, 5 to 10 and 10 to 15 centimeters. The signal intensity of the rectal growth tells us something about the histological type of rectal cancer. We see intermediate signal intensity in most commonly in a well and a moderately differentiated rectal and adenocarcinomas. Hyperintense and mixed signal intensities are usually seen in mucinous rectal cancers. Hypo-intense signal is less commonly encountered and we see this kind of structuring annular rectal growth in poorly differentiated signet ring cell cancers which is similar to the linitis plastica of the stomach. These are diffusion weighted images demonstrating that the signet ring cell cancers do not show restricted diffusion and are thus less useful in evaluating these patients. MRI images show different morphological types of rectal cancer, polypoidal growths with and without pedicles, infiltrating structure forming, 
rectal cancer and ulcerating intermediate signal rectal growths. The T stage can be very eloquently demonstrated using MRI. In these examples, we can see a less than T1 stage tubulovillus adenoma with a short pedicle and the base of the pedicle is not infiltrated by the tumor signal and we can see an intact muscularis propria. This is a less than T1 stage rectal tumor. Whereas in the second example, we can see puckering of the rectal wall, but an intact muscularis propria. Though the tumor signal reaches the base, muscularis is not infiltrated in T1 stage. In a T2 stage, there's at least a partial thickness muscularis infiltration Desmoplastic reaction as shown in this uh, image should not be mistaken for a T3 stage. In T3 stage, there should be a clear tongue-like tumor growing, nodular tumor growing into the mesorectal space. Depending on the degree of extramural spread, T3 tumors are classified as good and bad because degree of extramural spread has a close bearing with the disease-free survival. T4A stage is when there is peritoneal infiltration. In this T2 very dark growth, it's easy to appreciate hypo-intense tumor infiltrating the pelvic peritoneum along the dome of the bladder and the seminal vesicle. In the very same patient, we can see how this focal peritoneal infiltration progresses to diffuse peritoneal metastasis seen as progression of ascites and later on a sheet of tumor lining the serosal surface of the pelvic small bowel lobes. T4B disease is when there is adjacent structure infiltration. Puborectalis infiltration and levator ani infiltration is best depicted on coronal MRI and prostate and infiltration is best seen on axial image. MRI has at least an 85% sensitivity in depicting the end stage in demonstrating the end stage of in rectal cancer when a combination of size and shape criteria are used. In this example, we can see a very small lymph node but has an irregular shape and tumor signal intensity and thus would be reported as a significant mesorectal lymph node. Extramural vascular invasion or EMVI is an important thing to recognize and report because it's a poor prognostic marker for local recurrence, margin positivity, pelvic sidewall, metastasis, and disease-free survival. How do we see that? It's a tumor that is growing into the mesorectal vein and we can see a serpiginous structure running in the mesorectal fat. How do we differentiate that from a tumor deposit or the N1C disease? N1C is discontinuous, it's irregular but along the vessel, but has similar prognostic significance as EMVI. An effort now is trying to be made to differentiate tumor deposit from lymph node. What is CRM? CRM is a surgical terminology which, which is the plane of the TME surgery. And this concept is extrapolated to MRI by determining the shortest distance between the mesorectal fascia and one of these tumor, node, EMVI, or tumor deposit. When the distance is less than one millimeter, it is called an involved CRM. And CRM interpretation in MRI is highly accurate and one must remember to interpret CRM only along the invading margin of the growth. As one can intuitively understand, CRM is a concept that is meant to be used only for the portion of the rectum enveloped by mesorectal fascia and not for the peritonealized portion of mid and high rectum. Pelvic sidewall disease is associated with EMVI and these pelvic sidewall nodes must be recognized and reported and also included in the radiation field. 
External mesorectal nodes, some of them are regional, some are non-regional. One must recognize that presequel, internal iliac and obturator nodes are regional lymph nodes, whereas external iliac, common iliac, parioptic and inguinal are metastatic. MRI is extremely useful and very sensitive in identifying subcentimetric liver metastasis and by far the best modality to pick up this kind of liver metastasis. This is an image demonstrating how the post-treatment change in a rectal cancer. The posterior wall rectal growth becomes thick and hypo-intense in a restaging MRI. One is not sure whether this is complete response or incomplete response, and that is the role of diffusion-weighted imaging. In this pretreatment diffusion-weighted MRI, one can recognize that this, is high, this hyper intense growth completely disappears in a restaging diffusion-weighted MRI, and this was reported as complete response and later proven on pathology. I purposefully kept this question of MRI versus CT to the very end of the presentation. And I want to emphasize that MRI scores over CT for TME plane safety, especially in a low rectal cancer because of superior soft tissue resolution. And it is better than all modalities in delineating parameters of prognostic significance. I'll show you this in two examples, how CT overestimates compared to MRI. This posterior semiannular growth at T2 stage because of an intact muscularis can be mistaken to be a T3 annular growth on CT scan. And similarly, the CRM, which is supposed to be along the measured along the posterior uh, wall, the leading or the pushing margin of the tumor, which is at least 18 millimeter, can be passed off as zero millimeters if CT is used for stage. In the second example, a T3 stage anterior semiannular growth with a CRM of 3 mm can be mistaken as a tumor which is annular with no CRM. So these two examples demonstrate potential overstaging with CT in, in lower stage rectal cancers, whereas I want to emphasize that a T4 stage rectal cancer can be understaged with a CT scan. So in this presentation, I've given you enough uh, to show you that MRI is the standard of care for local staging of rectal cancer and for excluding liver metastasis. And we've seen why we should use MRI, we've seen how we should MRI, and we've seen what MRI can tell us. Thank you very much for patient listening. Thanks so much, Dr. Chandramohan, uh, on that uh, uh, very informative presentation. We'll move on to the next speaker, who is Professor Kimaldi, who's going to talk about uh, total mesopolic excision in colonic cancer this evening. Uh, he needs no introduction, however, just a few words. Uh, Professor Kimaldi is the former chair professor of uh, in surgery in Faculty of Medicine, University of Kelonia. He is widely published in colorectal surgery. He has being the recipient of at least six orations and delivered over 350 presentations. Uh, without much further ado, uh, may I uh, ask Professor Kamaldi to kindly get on with this presentation. Um, a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Duminda and Mahanama for, for sharing the session and be great to join in on this uh, never before Zoom conference for the College of Surgeons. Um, my brief is to talk uh, in the next few minutes on total mesocolic excision, uh, which really is a following on from mesorectal excision that Bill Heald showed many, many years ago that has uh, significantly impacted upon the recurrence, local recurrence rate of rectal cancer. And essentially what they do in total mesorectal excision is to provide a package that is confined or enveloped within the visceral peritoneum of the rectum and therefore it has all of its fat lymph nodes and its extranodal deposits that when contained within uh, such a capsule are likely not to spill out of the uh, rectum or the dissection field into the pelvis and cause local recurrence. 
Now, with total mesocolic excision, it's essentially the same principle, but it uh, e extends itself to other equivalents and other conditions uh, that really call help us call it the mesocolic package. So for the benefit of uh, the trainees listening in on this uh, program, um, there is an anatomic component of mesocolic excision. There is a vascular component of mesocolic excision, and there is a lymph node component of mesocolic excision. And all of these three things taken together formulate the package of total mesocolic or sometimes called complete mesocolic excision. Let's first focus on the mesocolic excision plane. And essentially, it is an anatomical plane that separates the anterior located visceral peritoneum from the posterior fascia or the peritoneum overlying the retroperitoneal structures. And that includes the ureter. So if you get into this plane very early on, and that is exactly how surgery should be performed uh, if you're doing it laparoscopically, you enter the, the medial plane. If you're doing it open, then you enter the lateral plane to, through the white line of torque that you will divide and enter this areolar plane, which is a bloodless plane, easy to teach residents, easy to learn, and also an enjoyable operation because uh, you're operating in, in essentially in areolar tissue. And you can safely know that you're not in the way of harm to the ureter, whichever side you might be operating on. But the important concept here if you, is if you look at the yellow structure, which represents the fat in this diagram, what you're seeing is you're incorporating all of the pericolic and the mesocolic fat in one package, and then eventually the dissection leads onto its feeding artery. So the feeding artery or the main trunk artery of the mid gut, which is the right colon, is the superior mesenteric and the hindgut uh, is the inferior mesenteric artery. And so you're essentially operating around these arterial pedicles. So having said that, people have also talked about how far there is this talk about a high ligation versus non-high ligation, particularly for rectal cancer, and uh, what the benefit of high ligation is versus low ligation. But in this situation where we're talking about mesocolic excision, and the honors go to the team from Erlangen who really described this technique and made us focus upon, although many have been performing the procedure for years, actually made us focus on uh, mesocolic excision. And that team recommends that we go right up bang against the origin of uh, the supplying vessel from the main artery. So if this on in a right hemicolectomy is your superior mesenteric artery, here's your ileocolic artery and so you're ligating it there, not here. And on the right side of your picture, if you see the diagrammatic representation of the left colon, uh, here's your tumor in the sigmoid colon region. You're taking out all these vessels and taking out the left, normally it would be imperative to leave the left colic, but here they go right up the IMA and take it right out of the uh, front of the aorta. The reason they do this is because then you have your mesocolic package all in one. And that means you have the affordability of presenting your pathologist with uh, all of the fat, all of the lymph nodes contained within that drainage package for evaluation. So no excuses for your pathologist. The important thing data that's coming out of here is that the five year survival is significantly different if you do complete meso excision or CME or total mesocolic excision and central vascular ligation as in taking it off from the origin compared with the not so good classic group where people would take it halfway up the blood vessel. So it's that this is an important statistic that we need to think about when we offer patients uh, the prospect of cure in colon cancer. Here's the important uh, bit of data you need to focus upon, and it's all centered around lymph nodes. Uh, previously, there was an association uh, of thought where lymph nodes, if you sampled only 12, was sufficient, but even if you sampled 12, there was no guarantee that your pathologist would actually look at 12 and give you a, a, a number uh, equivalent to 12 nodes examined. But the data show that 
If you provide this package with all of the lymph nodes, then survival is indirectly proportional to the positive number of lymph, number of positive lymph nodes that you have. So the more lymph nodes you give your pathologist, the greater the chance that they might be able to find positive nodes and therefore um, prognosticate on survival. The corollary is also true that five-year survival is directly proportional to the number of examined nodes. So that, in a sense, redirects us to thinking about total mesocolic excision. Here's another bit of interesting data, and that shows again that with increasing survival, you see a decreasing lymph node ratio. And what I mean by lymph node ratio is that the number of positive nodes upon the total number of lymph nodes sampled in that place. So that in a way uh, makes sense compare, comparing this with the previous slide. But the things that are not clear is, there, do more lymph nodes become available for examination? just because you perform a complete resection of your mesorectal tissue or mesoenteric or mesocolic tissue? Probably not because you need to have pathologists on board and it's here so important about having a colorectal pathologist or a pathologist who has worked in the area field with you for a long time because they and only they understand the importance of uh, examination of 12 nodes minimum. Uh, the best of course is to get as much as 24 nodes. And so there in, they introduce us to this phenomenon of stage migration. And what, what do we mean by stage migration? Again, um, there are, if you don't have the 12 nodes that you need to, there is a possibility that an individual with colon cancer may be under stage two, whereas the actual stage might be three. There are significant implications of this because stage two disease without lymph nodes means the individual is not a candidate for adjuvant chemotherapy. Whereas if you've got stage three disease, then chemotherapy adds to the survival benefit. So I think stage migration is an important aspect of the need to undertake um, total mesocolic excision. So on your left hand side of the screen, you see this specimen here that gives us the entire colon in its entirety with its absolute package of fat. And that allows us to give our pathologists the greatest chance of examining all the lymph nodes in here, as opposed to half a specimen cut, cut across there. And when you examine this right hemicollector specimen, as on the right side, you see the diagrammatic representation of the lymph nodes, you get pericolic nodes, N1, zone two is N2 nodes, which really are nodes that go from the pericolic area right up to your complete high ligation or complete vascular ligation, central vascular ligation. And beyond that, you get a few nodes that are not essential to be removed, probably will come up in dissection and in, in, your, in our discussion. And these are the nodes referred to as D3 dissected nodes, uh, often add to increase morbidity and mortality. And, and, uh, and so therefore there is a little bit of controversy in between centers, uh, practicing colorectal surgery, high volume colorectal surgery about whether we should be doing D3 dissection. But this is an example of, uh, of the retroperitoneum as you would do it in a complete mesocolic excision specimen uh, of your right hemicolectomy. You've got to see the third part of the duodenum or the horizontal part of the duodenum. You've got to see the uncinate process. You've got to have taken your vessels right up against your superior mesenteric vein and superior mesenteric artery. And this is the standard of care for D2 dissection. D3 dissection goes right across to the other side of the superior mesenteric artery. And we know that that, that is associated with mor morbidity and mortality. So uh, just to sum up, Total mesorectal excision, the benefit of removing nodes up to the apex of vascular ligation, you might just upstage disease. As a result of a greater lymph node, uh, sampling closer to the central vascular structures, you will probably pick up, pick up all the skip lesions that might be incorporated otherwise. Uh, you will also be able to pick up microstatic or micrometastatic nodes, pick up extranodal deposits and the data out of this group from the east is telling us that up to 11% of central D3 nodes have been involved in right colon cancer. So there is controversy here because 
removing positive nodes does not really give uh, the prospect of KO or significant survival benefits. Important to identify nodes that are positive for adjuvant ther therapy selection. So the jury is really out on total meso mesocolic ex excision with D3 dissection. For mesocolic excision, you have the prospect of greater lymph node harvest, and that certainly influences stage migration. And by providing a total mesocolic specimen, which I think is, is a standard of care for all of us, it prevents tumor cell spillage into the retroperitoneal area or into the resection bed, and therefore avoid or nullify the risk of uh, local recurrence. Against mesocolic excision, particularly D3 resection, it's a greater operative morbidity. It takes a longer operation. There's the risk of vascular and solid organ injury, and there is a higher risk of anastomotic complications because obviously you're taking it high uh, in the blood vessel and there might be uh, vascular compromisation. However, data from Sweden coming out this year have shown no significant survival, at least a demonstrable benefit, and there are absolutely no randomized control trials between central vascular ligation, CME, versus non-central vascular ligation, how we've all done it before, and CME. So in some, to conclude, I think there are three concepts of mesocolic excision. Uh, one is to provide a surgical package designed to deliver a resected specimen of colon cancer complete with its visceral peritoneum enveloping containing all of its mesocolic fat and lymph nodes. The goal of T TME or total mesolic, mesocolic excision is to enable pathology evaluation of all cancer-related regional no lymph nodes, bearing in mind that a minimum of 12 nodes has to be examined by the pathologist. And it is achieved by meticulous dissection of the cancer uh, between the segment of colon, between fascial planes, and by central vascular ligation. Thank you, gentlemen, for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamaldeen, for that uh, very informative lecture. Since, uh, since we have already passed time, I would like to invite Mr. Gillam Sao Kuliao. He's a colorectal surgeon from Angelita and New uh, Gama Institute, Hospital Alamau, Oswald Cruz Hospital BP, Sao Paulo, Brazil. I will not um, go through his long and impressive CV, which is also given in your uh, uh, book. So over to you, uh, Mr. Gulam, uh, Gilam Sao Puliao. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back in Sri Lanka to talk okay. again about watch and weight. My name is Gilam. And today I'm going to speak about the new developments in watch and weight protocol and rectal cancer. These are my disclosures. So when we talk about watch and weight, we need to know where it came from. So chemoradiotherapy was initially recommended for patients with high risk features in the MR, like threatened MR, EMR, MVI, or uh, lateral nodes. And then a standard chemoradiation uh, regimen was offered for these patients with the purpose of having a better local control. And then some of them would go to total mesorectal excision, while some of them would eventually develop a complete clinical response and would be managed by watch and wait. With this strategy, we Nowadays, know that these patients will have this very similar oncological outcomes to those that were operated either for a pathological complete response or even a clinical complete response and surgery. Some of them, during their follow up, will develop a local regrowth, which is around 22% in the first three years. But uh, the only risk factors to developing a local regrowth for these patients identified up to now, up to date, is the initial T stage. So those that were initially a T1 or a T2 have a much lower risk of developing a local regrowth when comparing to T3 or T4 tumors. Recently, we uh, analyze these patients using a concept of conditional survival. And we could demonstrate that 
those patients that did not develop any local regrowth in the first three years, they have a very low risk of developing any further local regrowth and that risk factor of earlier T stages to protect in the risk of local regrowth disappear after three years. So um, both the early and the locally advanced T stage tumors in the beginning have similar risks of local regrowth after three years. The great advantage of watching weight and their local regrowths is that they are operable. So when we, we identify a local regrowth, we usually can offer the same operation we would do in the, in the beginning if we had operated these patients straightforward with a very good local control. In this scenario, the watch and weight has been um, accepted in, the, in many places around the world. And now we, we're moving to a new concept. So classically, only those patients with high risk features would have the chance of having an accidental watching weight and accidental organ preservation. While those patients with low risk features like stage one tumors, they would not go to long course chemo radiation. They would go straight to upfront surgery. And what is changing now is that perhaps we should offer these patients with long course chemo radiation with the only objective of obtaining a complete clinical response and avoiding such major and morbid operation for a patient that's, that have a much earlier stage than those that were uh, initially treated with long course chemo radiation. So to demonstrate this, let's take an example like this patient here, which is an early T2 tumor, very low, you can see that's just on the level of the anorectal ring, would definitely undergo either an Miles operation with abdominal perineal excision or a neutral low with colorectal anastomosis, which we all know that the function is quite poor. The regimen of chemo radiation that we would offer for this patient is a bit different from the standard one that you all know. These years, recently, this year, on ASCO meeting, three different trials were presented showing very good benefit with the uh, addition of further chemotherapy in the regimens of chemoradiation. The OPERA trial was the only one that assessed for the risk of uh, having a TME-free survival, showing that consolidation chemotherapy was a good option to try to increase the rates of uh, TME-free survival. We've been offering consolidation chemotherapy for these patients for a long time now, over 15 years. In our earlier publication, we could show uh, initial clinical complete response rate of around 65%, which is much higher than the standard regimen, which is around 25 to 30%. And this regimen is got uh, is demonstrated here in this in this figure. So over six weeks, we offer long course chemo radiation with 54 grays of radiotherapy instead of 50.4 grays. And instead of offering only two cycles of chemotherapy, we offer six cycles of chemotherapy, three during the radiotherapy and three during the resting period, like you can see here. When we compare the rates of complete response of organ preservation between the standard regimen and the extended regimen, uh, as I, I told you before, only for the early T2 node zero uh, patients, we could demonstrate that the chance of uh, not operating these patients after five years is uh, more than double. So 67% of patients that had the extended protocol, the consolidation chemotherapy, 
had a chance of never being operated due to the to his cancer while when we offered the standard chemotherapy it was around 30 percent and once again we are here talking about earlier tumor the t2 and 0 watch what we're now calling the intentional watching way which are those patients that had radiotherapy with the only purpose of not being operated of being followed on a watch and wait protocol, protocol. However, not all the patients were successfully treated with radiotherapy. As you can see, only 67%, around 30% of them were not successfully treated with uh, chemoradiation. And for these patients, we did uh, chemoradiation for no purpose. So the idea now is, can we at some time predict those patients that will develop a complete response. And in this case, we would only offer chemoradiation for those that we know that will have a complete response, while those that will not develop a complete response, we would operate straightforward and avoid all the risks involved with chemoradiation. So we uh, develop a score based on DNA, DNA repair genes, and we tested this score on our cohort, on a cohort from the Cleveland Clinic and another cohort from Japan. And we could demonstrate that with this score, the negative predictive value is really high. So what that means? It means that if the score is high, it's positive, this patient has a 50% of good response. What does it mean? It does not mean much but if the score is negative is low score the poor response rate for this patient is 90 percent what does it mean it means if, if we have a patient with a early stage very low tumor that wants to go for an organ preservation we perform the dna repair score if the score is high then maybe this patient will have a complete response so we should go forward with the chemo radiation and try for a complete response on the other hand if the score is low then the chance of this patient developing a complete response is really poor is really low now less than 10 percent of having a complete response so these patients should definitely go for a TME up front and not waste time trying for a complete response. This is completely experimental nowadays. We've published this year, this score. Um, we're sure we'll have further institution applying this score as a test, as a further validation before it can use on clinical practice. So in summary, watch and wait is good for those patients with complete clinical response. Initially, we had only those with early advanced tumor, but now we can also have it for early tumors. The surgery for these patients with complete clinical response does not offer any survival benefits, so it's, um, it should not be offered. The follow-up is critical for this patient because during follow-up we'll, we'll identify uh, local regrowth in around 25% of these patients and if we identify it we'll, we'll operate and perform the same operation with no uh, harm to our patients and this follow-up critical should be intense in the first three years when the risk of regrowth is higher. After three years, the risk of regrowth is much lower and the follow-up can be softened a bit. The intentional watch and wait is the new concept that needs to be in your mind. So early tumors that we would not offer it chemo radiation, perhaps we should offer it chemo radiation with the only objective of obtaining a complete response and follow these patients without uh, uh, such big operations. And and uh, luckily in the near future we will have tools as this one that i demonstrate for you to predict response and and this near future probably 
we will only offer chemo radiation for those patients that we will know that they will develop a complete clinical response. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I leave here my uh, my thanks to my professor, Professor Angelita, and all and all of your attention. It was a pleasure to be here. It will I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, uh, Professor uh, Mr. Juliao, for that presentation. In the interest of time, we have uh, just enough time for us to discuss one question. Um, this question might interest Professor Kamadine, I guess. The question is, does D3 resection increase the risk of post of bowel dysfunction due to disturbance of autonomic nerves? Uh, that's a great question, Duminda, but, but I think, so yes, it can do because you're operating very close to the, uh, the autonomic nerves in the region of the duodenum, and we know that if you mobilize the duodenum, it leads to uh, motility disorders. But just like we learned from the TME, where you need to preserve the hypogastrics and stay in front of the hypogastric when you take your IMA, we will eventually learn all of these things. So right now, the answer is we don't know, but it is a learnable thing. The, the real issue is, does it make a difference in survival? And the data coming to and for, for and against suggests that there is no huge difference in survival, which is why we need randomized studies or even a meta-analysis of more uh, data coming out of other units. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, another question, uh, probably you might have a minute or so about another, uh, for another question. Can you mention any steps that you may take to avoid troublesome, ble uh, troublesome bleeding in total uh, CMV? So I think with, uh, with total CMV, the steps you take are the usual steps of surgery, but it would be nice to have when you're operating particularly in the right colon and, 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 and you're dealing with the artery or the, or, or the mid gut, it would be nice to have a, a colleague who's a hepatobiliary surgeon operating with you in your learning curve. Because these guys, the hepatobiliary surgeons, in my opinion, are expert in the region of the SMA, SMB, portal vein area, and they can teach you a lot. And so I think the, the important thing is now to be operating in, in consultant teams of two, where one may not be a colorectal surgeon, but putting those two uh, bits of attributes together, we can get success. So uh, that's my that's my uh, answer or response to how you could have a, a fairly steep learning curve shortened up very quickly. Good question from Mr. Ugliao. Uh, there's question, is there a role of aspirin in preventing metastasis? Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry, I did not understand completely the question. If there is any call to prevent... Is there a role of aspirin therapy? in preventing metastasis? Aspirin. Aspirin in preventing metastasis. Aspirin. 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 Well, the risk of metastasis for patients developing a complete response is really low. So uh, we, we've been seeing on recent publications that patients that do develop a regrowth have higher risk of developing metastasis than those that never develop a regrowth. This is probably related to the fact that these patients were never a pathological complete risk. Oh, aspirin. Okay. And uh, yeah, the, so the answer will be no, because... If a patient has a complete clinical response, the rate of metastasis is extremely low, extremely low, less than 5%. So some institutions also use chemotherapy, adjuvant chemotherapy for these patients after a complete response and the full new adjuvant treatment. But the risk is so low that there is no explanation to use either aspirin or further chemotherapy to prevent systemic recurrence. Thanks so much uh, for the speakers as well as the participants. Uh, with that, I think we have to sum up the session uh, to thank uh, and we thank the organizers as well as the participants for a wonderful time spent. Thanks. Thank you.